Welcome everyone. I'm so glad that you're here joining us today. My name is Janet Lee and I'm the Executive Director of the Kabuki Syndrome Foundation, also known as KSF. Um, however, my most important job title is mom to two children, Ryan and Emily. My daughter Emily is 14 and has Kabuki Syndrome. Um, she just graduated from middle school on Friday and we have spent the last week celebrating this awesome victory. Um, you know, like any parent, I, I want my daughter to reach her greatest potential. And like many of you, over the last 14 years, I have sought every possible therapeutic treatment that could help her. Everything from occupational therapy, physical therapy, speech and language, to all of those annual visits with the variety of medical specialists. Um, and we're all too familiar, especially for those of us with school-aged children of the annual school support meetings where I've just advocated tirelessly for supports that enable her to access the curriculum. Individuals with Kabuki syndrome may be affected differently, but as parents and caregivers, we are all united in one goal, a better future for our children. Emily's diagnosis mobilized me to play an active role in transforming the hope of a treatment into reality. She is my inspiration, my heart, and my reason for being a part of KSF. KSF is not just a foundation. Um, we are a lifeline dedicated to empowering you and your family with the knowledge, resources, and hope for a healthier future for your child. The mission of KSF is to drive research efforts that accelerate treatments for those affected by Kabuki syndrome, because every child with Kabuki syndrome deserves the chance to reach their full potential. Next slide, please. In order to make research more accessible to the community, we felt it was important to provide multiple, more targeted touch points throughout the year. We want you to feel excited and encouraged by the progress that is happening. And more importantly, we want you to become engaged in research efforts. Today marks the first of our webinar series titled Roadmap to Treatments for Kabuki Syndrome. During our webinar today, you're going to be able to meet our newly appointed research team who will walk you through the extensive work that went into developing the Kabuki Syndrome Research Roadmap. This roadmap addresses our community's highest priorities and addresses the biggest gaps in research. Then we'll share how you, as a parent, a caregiver, a family member, an individual with Kabuki syndrome can get involved. And then we'll open it up for Q&A. The biggest takeaway for you all today is that you have a better understanding of the work of our foundation and the steps that we need to take as a community to find treatments faster we polled our audience members at the start of the session, and I can see there are some of you that are still filtering in. Um, at this point, I'd like to share those results with you. The first question that we asked was, what percent of rare diseases do not have an FDA approved treatment? And actually the majority of you answered correctly. Shockingly, 95% of rare diseases do not have any FDA approved treatments due to the lack of research and funding. Treatments for those rare diseases with an FDA approved treatment, however, were nearly always made possible by active patient and family communities. KSF is creating organized collaboration, connecting global communities and driving research through our LEAP roadmap, which you'll learn about today. The second question we asked was, how many rare disease treatments has the FDA approved in the first five months of 2023? And I'm trying to find the results of that. And it looks like, ah, most of you answered less than five. I'm happy to share some very encouraging news with you. 15 rare disease treatments have been approved by the FDA in the first five months of 2023. Patients and their families have a different level of urgency and we are motivated like no one else in the world. Finding a treatment for Kabuki syndrome is possible, but it will take all of us. So over the last two years as a foundation, we have expanded our network within the rare disease space 
We've spoken to several foundations, many of whom either have treatments in the pipeline or have an FDA approved treatment. Remember the 5% of rare disease groups who have an FDA approved treatment? Not only have we spoken to many of them, we've developed relationships with them. The two key takeaways from our discussion with these foundations was that progress can be accelerated with the following pieces in place. Highly motivated community of parents and family members with an incredible sense of urgency to find treatments and the ability to fundraise aggressively and immediate access to tools and dedicated resources that had the skills, the scientific knowledge and the industry connections to push progress ahead. I am so excited to introduce you to Dr. Bruce Bloom and Dr. Clara Tang, our newly expanded research team, who not only share in our vision of accelerating treatments, but have over 20 years of combined experience in the drug development space. I invite you to Google them when you have a moment. You're going to be so impressed. We are incredibly fortunate. Having this team in place presents incredible possibilities for our children and the entire Kabuki syndrome community. And at this time, I'd like to introduce you to the KSF Chief Science Officer, Dr. Bruce Bloom. Thanks, Janet. Nice to, uh, to be here with all of you. I'm sorry that I can't be with you in person or even see you on my screen, but um, the last 20 plus years of my career has been spent in the rare disease community. And the thing that fills me with most hope and joy and inspiration is dealing with those affected by rare disease, whether it's the person who has the, the condition or the family member or friend that's supporting them or the advocate that is working on their behalf, the researchers and the clinicians that are doing the scientific and medical work. Um, that, that's what I, I do this kind of work for. Uh, for almost 20 years, I ran a charity in the headquartered in the United States, a global charity called Cures Within Reach. And we raised money to fund proof of concept clinical trials in drug repurposing. And during my time there, we brought over a dozen therapies to patients, most of them in the rare disease space, some of them life-saving treatments utilizing uh, nutraceuticals or drugs that were already approved for something else and could be uh, repositioned or repurposed for a rare disease. So I bring that kind of experience and a global network of researchers and clinicians uh, a lot of drug development experience to uh, to this. And I was fortunate enough to work with Clara um, at a, in a different work life and uh, know her skill set. And I got to know the members of the uh, the uh, Kabuki Syndrome Foundation. And uh, when they were looking for somebody to to come and help with this, um, I was glad to volunteer. So, over the last, uh, if you want to switch to the next slide, um, so um, mostly Clara, but Clara and I have worked uh, to start to put together a research roadmap and other resources available, and Clara will take you through the LEAP uh, program that uh, we have to figure out how we start moving all of the basic science research and the uh, clinical research forward as fat, as quickly as possible so that it can reach those impacted by the disease. And to start with, we did a, a gap analysis. Um, we spent months digging into the uh, landscape to understand what's going on on the basic science and the clinical side and what are the gaps. We read all the significant publications. We visited the, the relevant academic industry and advocacy websites in conversations with the key opinion leaders in research, clinical care, industry, patient advocacy. We talked with those who are caregivers and those who are patients, uh, and we looked for the gaps and what's necessary. And as Janet mentioned, we looked at those who have run other kinds of uh, patient advocacy groups and what have they done that accelerated the search for therapies that could uh, be delivered to, to patients. We also looked at what are the roadblocks and how might we overcome them? And what do we need to know to get 
get to treatments and, and move that kind of thing forward. So if you move on to the, the next slide, um, I mean, we really had discovered that um, there, there's so much going on in this space that is really positive. And with uh, a group like KSF and the other patient advocacy groups to steer things and push and fundraise and organize and create collaborations to share information so that everybody knows what's going on, we can really make uh, great progress. So we've already done some of the understanding what matters. Clara is gonna show you some of that work, um, what matters to patients, what matters to the researchers. So here we did a, a, a poll and as you can see, what matters to, um, their, well, you all know, because you're involved with Kabuki syndrome, how many different things are impacted by the mutations in the genes. And you told us and have told each other and the research and clinical community, the things that you're most interested in so that those who you care about who are impacted by this can lead their best lives are muscle tone and coordination, those are in large part controlled by the brain, speech and sensory processing. So all of those neurological systems are the top priority. And the good news is that a lot of the research work and a lot of the clinical work is focused in those areas. So hopefully with our support and your support, because we need to transform this working together, um, we can make those things uh, a reality for patients in the near future. So. I want to introduce uh, my good friend and colleague and one of the, the really superstars of the research uh, management world, uh, Dr. Clara Tang. So Clara, you want to take over? Thank you, Bruce. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Clara. I'm a neuroscientist by training. So I did a PhD and a postdoc in neuroscience at the University of Cambridge in the UK. And then since then, I've held various roles in the life sciences industry. So most recently, I was the Alliance Strategy Manager at Helix, which is uh, where I got, to, got the privilege to work with Bruce. Um, we led and manage our collaborations with patient groups and academics. And one of the key responsibilities was to add the patient voice into every step of Helix's drug development process, ensuring that research is patient-centric. And I'm very excited to combine my academic background and my industry knowledge in rare disease drug development to help KSF achieve this mission. So today I'm going to be taking us through some of the details and science. And don't worry, this won't be the first time that you'll hear this. And please feel free to ask questions. So as Bruce mentioned, we've done a lot of research to make sure that we fund and drive research initiatives that are patient-centric and will have the greatest impact in finding treatments for all people living with Kabuki syndrome. But before we dive into the results of that research and analysis, let's take a step back and look at the drug development process briefly. So how do treatments actually get to patients? Going from left to right, we first need to discover treatment and develop it. And to do that, we need to understand Kabuki syndrome. This means we need to know what molecules of proteins in your body are affected so that we can treat it find or design a drug against it. Once we have a therapeutic candidate, then we need to test and validate that candidate in cells or animal models. And this is called preclinical research. Researchers will look for signs that the therapeutic candidate works in attenuating some of the symptoms of Kabuki syndrome and that the therapeutic candidate is safe. And if it all goes well, we then need to conduct clinical trials to test the candidate in humans to make sure it is indeed safe and beneficial for people with Kabuki syndrome. If these trials are successful, then all the data from these trials and studies will be submitted to the regulatory agencies. So in the US, that is the FDA. So the FDA evaluates whether the therapy is safe and effective for people with Kabuki syndrome, whether the benefits of the therapy really outweighs the risk of the treatment. If the FDA approves the therapy, then the therapy can be made available to the public, to patients. And while I've laid out four seemingly simple steps, um, there is a lot that goes on in each of these steps. Not only do we need the drug or the therapy, each of these steps also require infrastructure, 
tools, resources, and people, including every one of you and our clinicians and researchers. We all need to collaborate, work together to drive this process to find treatments. And the therapeutic roadmap that we've developed focuses on making sure that we have all the resources and tools that we need so that we can have the best chances of success at finding a therapy. So to develop this roadmap, Bruce and I did a gap analysis. So we looked at literature, past conference materials, and talked to our researchers. And we want to understand what has already been done and assess what's missing. And for each of these steps, we gave an overall score. So the dark green parts of the circle indicate the process or the progress that we've made so far. And then the light green portion of the circle indicates the progress that we still need to make to complete the circle. And we have identified tools and areas that we need for each of these steps and prioritize them. And based on where we're at, in terms of the maturity of the field or the therapies that we have in the pipeline, we identified two areas that are the most urgent and of the highest priority. So the first is in treatment discovery. So we currently don't really have a good understanding of the Kabuki syndrome. While we have identified the two genes that cause Kabuki, we don't know how alterations in these two genes actually lead to symptoms of Kabuki syndrome. How in our bodies, the alterations in these two genes affect other genes, change the function of molecules or proteins, which in turn may change the function of other proteins and molecules, which then contribute to the symptoms of Kabuki syndrome that you experience or you see in your friend or child. We can't develop treatment if we don't know what we need to target. The other key area is having appropriate outcome measures and biomarkers that work for Kabuki syndrome. What are outcome measures and biomarkers? They are tools or assessment that researchers use to assess how effective the potential therapeutic is. So they could be physician assessment, patient and family surveys, blood tests, x-rays and more. And without them, it will be hard to run a successful clinical trial. Or even if we have an effective therapy, we can't measure and prove to the regulators that it works, that it is effective. So we also asked our medical and scientific advisory board, made up of Kabuki syndrome clinicians and researchers here on the left, what they think their high priority are to developing treatments for Kabuki syndrome. And they agree with these priorities. So 90% of our MSAB agreed that outcome measures uh, development is a priority to enable the advancement of Kabuki syndrome research. And 80% of the MSAB also prioritized our understanding of the underlying molecular pathways of Kabuki syndrome. Patient registry and improved animal models such as mice with Kabuki syndrome were the next highest priorities identified by the advisory board, which we will also see uh, areas that we've incorporated into the therapeutic roadmap. So having identified these gaps, we need to execute. We need to address these gaps to enable treatment discovery and development. And we're calling the therapeutic roadmap LEAP. So L stands for learn. We need to learn more about Kabuki syndrome. We need to better understand all the different disease causing pathways, the pathways or targets that lead to the symptoms of the Kabuki syndrome so that we can identify new treatment strategies that have the potential to improve quality of life for everyone living with Kabuki syndrome. E stands for enable. So as a foundation, we'll be funding and putting in place infrastructure that enables and enforces collaboration between patients, researchers, and clinicians. Collaboration is essential to fast-tracking treatments for Kabuki syndrome. A stands for accelerate. Based on our conversations with researchers, we know that there are at least five potential therapeutic candidates for Kabuki syndrome that are being explored in the lab, and we want to accelerate these therapeutics from the lab to patients. And lastly, P stands for prepare. It's very exciting that we have potential therapeutic candidates, but we also need the people, the tools to be ready for clinical trials when these candidates are ready. So there is a lot to do as a community and we will require a lot of funding and input from everyone. But we have a plan and I will now walk through each of these in a bit more detail so you understand why we have committed to racing 3.5 million over the next two years to drive this roadmap. So to learn more about Kabuki syndrome, we are awarding our, an annual discovery grant to accelerate research into Kabuki syndrome. Science and technology are always advancing, 
We don't want to have all our eggs in one basket. So we need to strengthen and diversify our therapeutic pipeline to make sure we have the therapeutic opportunities for all people living with Kabuki syndrome. And drug development is hard. Clinical trials can fail. So we need to have options and alternatives. The core for application to this year's discovery grant is already live, and we have already received nine letters of intent, so nine teams of researchers that plan to apply to this grant, and we are planning to announce the winners of the grant later this year in Q4. To apply, researchers will need to form a team of at least two people based at two or more different institutions, and this is to enforce collaboration because collaboration is so important in speeding up rare disease research. It would enhance the collective expertise and lead to more comprehensive outcomes, which is why we have dedicated a whole pillar of the roadmap to enable collaborations. Bruce and I are organizing and running a scientific symposium in October targeted specifically at the scientific and research community. And the goal of the symposium would be to enable knowledge sharing and stimulate discussion and collaboration amongst the scientific community. The second project is the Outcome Measures and Biomarkers Consortium. So we need outcome measures and biomarkers for Kabuki syndrome to be ready for clinical trials. It is a high priority area that can really benefit from a consortium approach. So the consortium allows researchers access to a larger pool of patients, so increasing the number of samples that they can access, which also makes their research more robust. It also reduces costs through sharing resources and risks. It will also enable a better experience for you all, our patients and families, as it reduces the number of site visits that you'll need to make as you'll be contributing samples for the validation of several biomarker research projects at the same time. So we are in the process of setting this consortium up and we'll be enforcing a collaboration through milestone-driven contracts and data sharing policies. And we'll be sharing more information about this exciting project later this year so please stay tuned and sign up for updates. We will also be supporting a repository of patient samples and data. We know many of you have already contributed samples for research and answered many different questionnaires and surveys. And we want to make sure that your samples and data are accessible to researchers that need them. We want to minimize duplication of effort and maximize the use of your precious samples. And we're still in very early stages of planning and exploring different options. Technology is always evolving and we are exploring that what the best options are out there and make sure that it will work for all of you. Accelerate is all about getting the candidates that we've already identified so far in the lab to clinical trials. And this will be supporting Horizon's Feffy Dunstead trial, Hope. We are actively setting up a collaboration with Horizon and we'll be working closely with the Horizon team to bring the trial to you as quickly as possible, while also making sure that the trial will be patient-centric, ensuring that your needs and concerns will be taken into account and addressed. There are also a number of candidates that are in preclinical development, and our goal would be to leverage bruises and expertise in rare disease drug development to advance one or more of these candidates towards clinical trials. Lastly, in prepare our commissions and biomarkers development, this will be done through the consortium I mentioned earlier. And then for diagnosis of pre um, prevalence. So prevalence of Kabuki syndrome means the proportion of a population that have Kabuki syndrome. And it's often quoted that Kabuki syndrome affects one in 32,000 births. Now this figure was actually published back in the eighties before mutations in KMTGD and KDM6A were even identified as a genetic cause of Kabuki syndrome. So before genetic testing and now AP sign tests were even available. And this, off, this figure is also often misquoted. So we're working with an epidemiologist hopefully to get this figure updated. And whether we can update it will highly depend on data availability, which we will assess. And this is also why it's so important to speak up and participate in research. Pharmaceutical companies or biotechs always look for prevalence and when looking at a rare disease program. And so an up-to-date prevalence figure will hopefully catalyze more investment grants and pharma biotech interest. So there is a lot to do and I'm very excited to drive and execute this roadmap, but it can't happen without your help and contribution to make it a success. So Janet will outline some of the things that you can do today to help us. And I want to thank you all in advance for your help. And I look forward to working with you all.
Thank you so much, Clara. Um, as you can see, the research team has been incredibly busy over the course of the last five months. Um, we're just so excited to have the addition of, of Drs. Bloom and Clara Tang um, in our camp and um, are just really excited about the future and the potential and the opportunities um, that LEAP presents for our children in those diagnosed with Kabuki syndrome. So the big question is, is what, what can you do today? Um, we mentioned this earlier, but the two biggest barriers to finding treatments are lack of funding and patient participation. And really, we are going to be asking you all throughout the course of the next several months to help us change that. Uh, immediately, something that you can do is reach out to your own networks to support Kabuki syndrome research. Uh, we invite all of you to um, engage in fundraising efforts. Every dollar counts, and you're always welcome to reach out to myself um, and others in the KSF team to support local events and initiatives. We've got toolkits that we can send you. Um, anything that you can do to help us reach our goal to support LEAP and activate it is critical. Um, in terms of participating, we understand that patients' active involvement is absolutely critical for accelerating the development of treatments. Uh, there are some open opportunities on our website. There are virtual opportunities at our website. And I will tell you that over the course of the next three months, you will be hearing more specific ways as to how you can participate in the LEAP roadmap. And we just ask that you're ready for that. Uh, we all understand that patient data is powerful. Um, we've already administered two KSF crowdsourcing surveys. Uh, we're working in collaboration with Kabuki UK to develop another community survey, and we will be engaging the global community in that. Um, data is power, and we want to empower you with the tools to be able to participate and use that data to effectively drive our research initiatives. Next slide, please. Um, so we want you to save the date for these upcoming virtual events. Um, I had mentioned earlier that we would like more frequent touch points with you. And while this is not an exhaustive list, um, we did want you to be sure to mark these on your calendars. Uh, for patients and families, we're inviting you to join us on October 1st to get, gain a better understanding of Kabuki syndrome. We'll have Dr. Tang break down the science behind the syndrome and how it relates to ongoing research and potential treatments. Understanding this is really going to be pivotal in helping you make the best decisions on how you would like to participate in research. Uh, we also do have our annual virtual family conference scheduled for November 7th. As in the past, this event will feature researchers, clinicians, and community panels. Um, and for all the scientists on the call, as Dr. Tang mentioned, we are hosting our annual scientific symposium on October 26th. Next slide. We know that we've thrown a lot of information at you. Um, this is not going to be the first time you will be introduced to LEAP. It will be, uh, there will be several other opportunities for you to learn more about this research roadmap, to be engaged in it. And we really do invite you to take the next leap forward with us. We really hope that today provided um, and um, gave you an opportunity for a better understanding of how KSF is driving research and the steps that we need to take as a community to find treatments faster. Our door is always open. Please connect with us at any time at the email addresses on the slide. At this time, I'd like to invite our panelists back for the Q&A. And I'd also like to invite Amanda Gamboa, who is our outreach, outreach coordinator to join us for the Q&A. As a reminder to our audience, um, please enter your questions directly in the Q&A and not in the chat. And special thank you to our volunteers, Jessica Weatherstone and Kristen Anzelt for helping us monitor the chat. So we have, we do have, oh yes, we do have a number of questions, which also we have answered some of the questions um, via um, just typing, um, but we'll answer some questions also live. Um, so an anonymous, Richard Jones, asked um, whether we can give us a sense of some of the discovery grant applications, such a great idea. Thank you for the question. So 
the discovery grant um only opened i guess in well at the end of april but um we first received the letters of intent earlier this june and the applications is actually due at the end of next week on 30th of june um so the discovery grant the objective is to identify accelerate re basic science research but also identify new therapeutic opportunities uh, and identify new targets and pathways for Kabuki syndrome therapeutics um, and the range of applications will have that focus but at the moment I think yeah, we are still quite early and we don't actually know what the applications we will get at the end would be so um, they will be yeah all have this focus of identifying new therapeutic targets or pathway mm. for Kabuki syndrome um, and we did receive applications for both types, type one and two. So this is very exciting. And it was great to see how many researchers were really excited and the interest in the discovery grant. So thank you for the question. I don't know, Bruce, do you have anything else to add or Janet, Amanda? I just think it's really exciting how one of the purposes of the discovery grant was to increase collaboration among the researchers. And it's so exciting to see how many of them are working with so many others. And we're we're learning about people who we didn't know were interested mm -hmm. in syndrome who are being pulled into the discovery grant. So one of the purposes of having a grant program like this is to discover new people that have either knowledge or interest that could be applied to a particular disease. So that's really exciting for us as well. You're muted still, Clara. Um, there is still a question for Corrine, whether there are, are there any AI machine learning experts on the KSF team? I myself is not an AI machine learning expert. Bruce? Um, well, I'm not an AI machine learning expert. <laughs> I do work full time for a company that uses AI and machine learning to uh, create therapies for rare diseases. At the present time, Kabuki syndrome doesn't uh, match well with our particular way of doing AI and machine learning. I am also working with a charity in the United States that I'm on the advisory board of called Every Cure, and they have a, an AI machine learning knowledge base, and um, I am working with them to see if they'll do some work around Kabuki syndrome uh, for for that. But I expect there's going to be a huge acceleration in that kind of AI and machine learning, especially with all of the generative um, AI out there like ChatGPT. Um, I'm also working with a couple of other groups that are starting to use ChatGPT and similar kinds of things to start to uncover uh, discoverable knowledge that it hasn't already been discovered because all of the bits of data are in different places in the world, but AI like ChatGPT can put them together and start to synthesize them. So it's an exciting time. I, I suspect, Corinne, if you ask that question, question a year from now, the answer will be completely different. That's how fast things are going. Right. Um, Sarah asked, will future treatments be available for both type one and two? The answer will be, I guess the, the goal would be from KSF is to find treatments and support and fund research into both types of Kabuki syndrome. And currently there are research opportunities on our website that are open to both type of um, Kabuki syndrome. Mm -hmm. So, and, our, and we do have members of our board and staff that have children with both types one and two. So we are very much supportive and want to find treatments for both everyone with Kabuki syndrome of all ages. Yeah, and I think I would add to that, there may be some places downstream where a single therapy might help um, many patients with Kabuki syndrome, whether they're type one or type two, 
Uh, there actually somebody else asked a question that I already answered by typing, but there may be other diseases that are similar to Kabuki syndrome that one or more of the therapies might impact. Um, and there may be some diseases different than Kabuki syndrome that get a therapy that might then be transferred over to the Kabuki syndrome uh, patient community. So there's there's lots of opportunity. And the more, you know, Clara mentioned all of the basic science understanding, the more we understand about the basic science of Kabuki, the more we can uh, find its similarity to other diseases, which either means we can borrow their knowledge to speed things up, or we can use our knowledge to help them. One of the things about Kabuki is that it's a, it's a rare disease, but if we find six other rare diseases that have a similar characteristic, now we're a much bigger combined community and we get more attention from the research community, the clinical community and industry. So Clara and I and the rest of the, the KSF team are always looking, how can we expand ourselves for greater impact to others and to make ourselves look bigger out in the world? I just wanted to add to that, you know, we are in constant um, communication with our disease cousins, so to speak. So those diseases that share a very similar underlying mechanism to Kabuki syndrome. And the really exciting thing about this is that many of our researchers and our advisors are actually providing, um, you know, scientific advice and advisory services for mm -hmm. these other rare disease groups. Um, so it makes it a lot is easier for us as a foundation to identify possible synergies. And I just want to say that that is something that we always have a pulse on um, and absolutely is a potential opportunity for us to continue to explore. I, I also wanted to say one thing that I meant to say earlier on in my presentation and forgot. Uh, neither Clara or I are you know, we have the word doctor in front of our names, but we're not physician yeah. doctors and uh, we don't give out any <clears throat> medical advice. And, you know, we often get questions about individual patients. And while we can give some general support around that, we don't do, we were neither qualified for or um, empowered to help any particular mm -hmm. uh, individual with answers to their medical needs. We leave that up to the, the medical community, but we can help point you to people who might have answers that would be really helpful. And that's a big part of what Amanda and Janet and, the, and Clara and I do is to help people get connected where they need connection. Right. So we have sort of three um, closely related questions. First is from Jose or Jose. Could we see some therapeutic opportunities in practice within five years? Catherine also asked, what's realistic timing for when clinical trials might begin and what age will kids need to be to participate? And it's sort of a third question that's similar is, will any of the five therapeutics being explored potentially improve outcomes mm -hmm. for all the Kabuki patients? What are the target ages of patients these could help? I will start. Um, so I guess in terms of, you know, whether when a clinical trial might begin, um, we know the Horizon trial hope wants to start as soon as possible. And I, it will be hopefully very soon. And the, the trial targets um, both adolescents and adults. So this trial will be um, targeting older patients um, first in this sense. So this would be yeah, one of the therapeutics that are um, targeting older patients. And I guess the way that actually therapeutic or clinical trial development typically works is usually it starts in the adults because the treatments need to be proven safe. And um, there is a lot other of other consideration or safety um, considerations when we're testing drugs in adolescents or even children because their brains are still developing, there is still growth to consider. So typically actually clinical trials usually starts in the adult population first to show that it is safe in Kabuki syndrome patients. And could we see some therapeutic opportunities in practice within five years? It, 
pilgrimage trial takes time, but you know, if everything goes well and if the horizon trial happens very soon and you know they only need one trial, that could potentially happen. But I would say maybe a bit longer than five years, but you know, anything is possible and we have hope and we are working very hard to actually make this happen as quickly as we can. Let me, let me, yeah, that's a great segue into something I wanted to, to talk about, which is uh, once clinical trials open up, they need patients. And one of the things we would encourage everybody listening, get your information in a patient registry, give some samples, get noticed, build up the, in whatever country you're in, build up the number of patients that are known, because when clinical trials open up, the best way for you to get access to that therapy is to be known, to have been followed, to be connected to the clinical sites. So we're really encouraging everybody to to get, you know, to get tested, um, to get a, a genetic, uh, you know, validation if you already have a clinical diagnosis. All of those things are going to make you much more likely to be selected and available for a clinical trial. And if the therapy isn't available in five years, but there are ongoing clinical trials, often patients who are in a clinical trial get to continue on the therapy if it's working, even when it's not yet available. So getting yourself available and registered and, and ready to go when those clinical trials start is going to be really helpful for the community and for each, each and every one of you that are interested in accessing these kinds of therapies. I also just wanted to add that one of the most exciting benefits about working with this foundation is being able to get exposure to all of the incredible work that's happening in the global landscape. And what's been so exciting to us is to see that there are potential candidates that are being looked at right now um, that may end up progressing to clinical trials. And it's something that you know we continue as an organization to get a better grasp of. But the fact that there are at least four or five potential compounds that we know of um, that are in have been studied preclinically and have by, identified as potential candidates is really encouraging and really amazing. As a community, there's still a lot that we need to do. Um, Clara had mentioned the need for biomarkers and outcome measures. So even though we've got these potential try these potential candidates in the pipeline, we won't be able to successfully test them unless we have Kabuki syndrome specific measures that can be used to really um, get a better understanding as the potential benefit of these therapeutics. So that is definitely one aspect of LEAP that we are highly prioritizing. And it's also an area where if we can really focus on establishing that infrastructure, to enable the validation of those um, outcome measures and biomarkers, we have the opportunity to accelerate that timeline a little bit more. And there is one uh, clinical trial that's already ongoing in the Kabuki space, uh, evaluating whether the keto ketogenic diet is uh, helping in certain ways. And um, I don't know, I, I think we have some preliminary thoughts about how that is going, but um, you know, it's good to see that somebody's actually started a clinical trial in Kabuki syndrome. Mm -hmm. And that clinical trial is also a great example of when we say that we need you to speak up and participate, and sometimes it's samples, but sometimes it's surveys. We conducted the crowdsourcing survey last year to focus on that clinical trial and how you could or would implement a keto diet at home, which is the focus of the trial. And based on your responses, we were able to share those with the primary investigator, Jackie Harris at Kennedy Krieger, and she's exploring ways to expand the trial, to lengthen it and increase the age of ranges that can participate. So thank you for those who are here and participated in that last year. And we'll be sure to keep you updated on that as well. Yeah, I noticed somebody else asked a question, what kind of samples do you need? Do we need to go in person or can we send samples? So there's all sorts of samples that we need. We need blood samples. Sometimes we need urine samples. Sometimes we need skin samples so we can grow cells that are for your particular mutation. So most of the time they people need to go in person to, to someplace and then 
to know that where they're going is able to collect the sample in the right way and get it to the registry where it will then be um, preserved and be useful in multiple places where research is taking place. Um, we're working on that right now at uh, Kabuki Syndrome Foundation. So keep checking in on our um, website and maybe the next seminar that we webinar we do will be just around how to find and, and provide clinical samples, how to get involved in the registries and the natural history, because those things are just so incredibly useful and make it much more possible that people will focus on Kabuki syndrome as a therapy that's worth working on. Absolutely. And if you know, if you want to start today, if you don't want to wait, um, you can go on our website and we'll drop the link in the chat. But we've um, separated the current opportunities by virtual and in person. So you can see what opportunities are available for you to participate virtually. Obviously, that's not going to include samples, um, but also what are your in-person research opportunities? And then potentially, um, if you have a scheduled blood draw, especially moving forward, um, if you or your child is already in the chair, already having some tubes drawn, it's very easy to add an extra tube. And that extra tube can go on to a researcher and make big difference for us. Every sample truly does count. Um, if you have any trouble finding one that fits your family and you want to just have somebody show you what to do and get involved, email any of us at any time and we're happy to connect you with the research opportunity that fits you. Yeah, and we're also looking at a couple of other ways of collecting samples. Uh, baby teeth that are coming out could be a potential place for us to collect samples. Um, even when your kid goes and gets a, a vaccination, inside the needle are some skin and, and muscle cells. And if we could figure out how to collect those and send them on, we can uh, you know, do double value in that your child can get a vaccination and we can get some samples that could then go to a registry. So we're investigating all sorts of things and trying to make this really easy for you and your uh, physicians and dentists to help us uh, expand where we get samples from. We had a couple of fundraising questions as well, um, specifically about how did we come up with 3.5 million and what the timeline is for that. Um, and that would be an excellent deep dive that we can either you know, host as a webinar potentially, we can field your questions via email, um, but that number is calculated based on, on months of research um, and budgeting that Clara and Bruce did with the researchers involved in those different projects. Um, but I'll let them speak more to that. I just wanted to or Janet, if you want to jump on and talk about the timeline. Or... Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I, I also want to just say that we are always, we're here for your disposal. And if there's ever an opportunity for us to engage you or your personal networks and really have, to Amanda's earlier comment, a deeper dive on um, what our fundraising target is, we're so happy to do that and break it down. You know, one of the, the goals of this meeting is we didn't want to overwhelm you, but we wanted to make sure that you understood and had a high level overview because we want you to take this journey with us. And to um, Amanda's and Bruce's earlier point, there's an opportunity to certainly get into more detail about each of the elements of LEAP and how those numbers were determined, but they weren't just drawn out of a hat. I can I can tell you that much. I mean, there are definitely um, specific areas within each of those initiatives that took months to really try to understand the budget. Um, one in particular is around the infrastructure that would be necessary to create a consortium for Kabuki syndrome uh, institutions, key institutions. Clara and Bruce have worked tirelessly with our um, investigators at each of these institutions so that we understood and had a really Fine, with a fine uh, you know, tooth comb, whatever, um, we're able to fully understand all of the resourcing requirements necessary um, at each of these institutions. And so um, I don't wanna to spend too much time going into that, but we can absolutely chat offline. Um, we'll also be updating our website to um, showcase a little bit more about how those budgets were determined. Um, but also, we're really happy to have a follow-up conversation. So just uh, please do reach out. Clara, do you want to pick maybe another um, research one? Thank you, guys. These are all great questions. Um, mm -hmm. I just captured them all. So if we didn't answer your question or we don't get to it, 
Um, it is and we will either answer it when we post this on YouTube, we can add that in the comments or you can email us directly anytime. While Clara's looking, um, I also wanted, there was a, a couple questions, I guess, to follow up on the HOPE clinical trial. And I wanted to share that, you know, um, actually Bruce had alluded to the fact that we, we have been working very closely with Horizon, the Horizon team to get a better understanding um, and finalizing some of the timelines, really hoping to have representative from the Horizon team join our November 7th conference um, to provide an update for the community. Um, so stay tuned. Uh, I know everybody's really anxious to learn more. Um, and I just wanted to share that we, we have been actively talking to them along with um, Kabuki UK as well. Um, and we'll be sure to share you information as, um, as we receive it. Yeah, I, I can already see we're not going to have a chance to answer all the questions or respond to all the things in the chat, but we'll we'll save the questions and we'll save the chat and we'll um, either post on the website or uh, make it available on the YouTube video that, that we do this. Um, I'm I'm sort of overwhelmed by the number of great questions. So there's 28 open questions and 14 answered questions. It's just what a what a uh, curious an engaged community you all are, that uh, there's so many of you here. I mean, we, at, we have 75 people, 75 participants, and just really now we have 29 open questions. So this is, your questions are actually great for the team here because it helps us to, to know what you're thinking because we can't talk to each one of you individually most of the time. So this is really great. I, are, what time are, are we closing at the top of the hour? Yes, we've got about five more minutes, um, so probably enough time for one more question. Um, no pressure, Clara, but uh, which question would you like to address? I mean, there are some, I guess, quick fire ones. Um, so Andrew asked, um, is a great point earlier from Janet about how treatment can benefit multiple rare diseases. What other rare diseases are KS closest cousins? Janet, do you want to start? Sure. Um, I don't know if I'll remember all of them. So, Clara, I'll have you jump in. Um, Rubenstein Tabby is one. Um, Wiedemann Steiner is another. Um, Kleefstra as well. And um, jump in. Who else? Who am I missing? I mean, so Kekriki syndrome is, a, as you may have heard from other resources, is an epigenetic disorder. And it is also, um, so that means that you know, it is affecting the chromatin um, that part of the reasons that Kabuki syndrome, you see the symptoms of Kabuki syndrome is that there is a chromatin imbalance. And there are also a bunch of other diseases, they're called chromatinopathies, that are also um, caused by this imbalance in chromatin. And there are also a range of different diseases that are in uh, chromatinopathies, and one of them is also called Cornelia de Lange syndrome, uh, which also shares a lot of similar um, similar characteristics or symptoms as Kabuki syndrome. Um, the way that um, I guess Jill and um, Jill Farner and Hans recently also published it, uh, and also I think Jackie also recently published a paper on Mendelian disorders of the epigenetic machinery. And again, um, there is also a number of syndromes, including yeah, Rubenstein, Tavy, um, Charge, um, that are also Weaver syndrome, that is also sort of similar, but maybe opposite um, to how Kabuki syndrome is being uh, looked at. Yeah. So, and sometimes we use terms that don't feel technical to us, but do for to you, like chromonopathies and uh uh epigenetics one of the things to sort of keep it simple in your mind epigenetics is sort of like the stoplight of the genetic traffic so when you have an uh, the epigenetics isn't working that might mean the stoplight's on for too long or at the wrong time or it's uh it's open it's a green light too much and so a gene that's supposed to only turn on a little turns on too much or it's a red light too much and a gene that is supposed to turn on doesn't, and that affects lots of things. And that's part of what's going on in Kabuki syndrome. And so we're, we're trying to figure out, is there a way to change 
how the red lights and the green lights go on and off? And if not, is there a way to fix what is what happens by either replacing stuff when the red light's on too long or stopping things from happening when the green light's on too long? Another question is, um, how are the clinical management guidelines progressing from Rich Ed? Um, we know that Dr. Bissett Barker, who is um, managing or leading the efforts in updating the clinical management guideline, is working very hard on this. And um, while he's working really hard on this, we've also recently, we're developing some resources for you um, to also be able to take to your physician based on some of the tables in the gene reviews. Um, Amanda, do you want to give a bit more details? I will actually just give you the document. If you give me one second, I'll put a downloadable link in the chat. Um, it's not yet on our website, but it has been approved um, by Dr. Margaret Adam, who is the author of the Gene Reviews article these are summarized from. So I'll add that to the chat. It'll also be in your follow-up email, and it will be on the website shortly. Yes, just to give a bit of background, the tables are um, selected data tables from Gene Reviews, and they are intended to be provided to your healthcare professionals um, for review and implementation, if appropriate. Um, they give you some recommended surveillance for um, individuals with Kripke syndrome and also evalu recommended evaluations following um, the initial diagnosis. So it outlines the system or con of concern, the evaluations that they, the physician uh, or specialist should be doing and some comments on what they should be looking for or considering when they're evaluating that system or concerns. So I hope that will be a good resource for you all. Um, Janet, oh, you look like you were No, I was gonna say absolutely. Um, and we are just at the top of the hour. And so, and I, I just was looking and we've got 29 open questions. Um, First of all, we just are so thankful for all of you um, for joining us today. Uh, if we didn't address your question, um, we will certainly try to address it offline. I also can't stress enough how much we have an open door policy. Please reach out to any of us. All of our um, website, uh, or excuse me, our emails will be provided to you uh, when we send out the post uh, event survey, which we hope you'll all take a minute just to fill out. Um, we want to hear from you. We want to support you in, we want to empower you. Uh, please share your thoughts and ideas on how we can make research more accessible. Um, I hope that you liked this format. We do intend to have many more short and sweet webinars for us to engage and provide updates. Um, but in between those scheduled webinars, please do reach out. Um, again, thank you so much for all of your support. Uh, we're just so excited about the potential opportunities ahead, and um, and again, just really excited to introduce our amazing research team to the community. I like to refer them um, lovingly as our dream team. Uh, we're really excited and lucky to have them in our camp. So um, again, we will be in touch soon uh, with very specific calls to action, uh, but we're excited for you to take this journey with us. Uh, thank you so much, everyone, for taking the time, um, and we will we will be in touch.